you know, with my passion for learning about new things. So I really want to thank you guys for accompanying me on this journey, being here every single week and learning all about leverage buyouts, private equity, although it may seem kind of daunting at first. You guys eventually grasped a lot of the concepts. And, you know, while I know a lot of you guys aren't going to head into the world of finance directly, you guys at least took the initiative to learn something new that wasn't being taught at schools. And I commend you for that. And, you know, after all of this, even if you don't understand finance or investment banking completely, but one thing I do want you to take away is to have that drive to learn new things and to start projects of your own. Because it's, it's because of my own project that I made that website, that I started expanding these chapters to India, North Carolina, New York, California, etc. That I made this club, that I started teaching with nonprofits to middle schoolers, etc. So it's, it's this one small seed that can really fruition into a giant plant, right? These small projects, these small ideas that you guys have, enact on them and build yourself. So, uh, again, thank you guys so much. I'm always going to remember you guys. And uh, as I proceed to college, if you guys have any questions in relation to finance or school in general, just reach out to me. You guys know my Instagram. And if you guys want my number, etc., I'll be happy to get it. But, yeah, thank you guys so much. <laughs> Attendance, if you guys want to scan this, you know, you're going to miss it, right? <laughs> Wait, you started IBC all over? Like, yeah, I started, I started IBC. We, we are one of the first high school investment banking clubs in the nation. So I'll talk about that soon, and our next year officers are going to talk about that. So we already have officers for next year. However, we have open positions such as graphic associate, graphic analyst, and curriculum analyst. And uh, next year's officers will likely hold elections for those uh, various positions. But you guys can talk about them with that, and they'll organize it next year. Again, this is yeah. What's up? So is there going to be like interview for like? I, I mean, yeah, there are certain requirements, like for example, this year for curriculum officers, we required them to go into the curriculum, we'd assign them a slide, and we wanted to see their speaking ability as to that content, and also their ability to do a bit more due diligence on that content, and, uh, you know, rehearse it to all of us. So that was kind of the technical portion of the interview stage. Uh, Again, this is the website, right? This is what me and Colin started. This is where we've put all of our curriculum. This is how other chapters around the world get insight into our curriculum and adapt it into their own investment banking clubs. And it's likely I'm going to be continuing to work on the IBC project. So let's say I start an article position or something like that where you research articles. Um, I, I may reach out to you guys. So if you're interested in that for your resume, et cetera, this may be a good opportunity. And then, of course, the link tree. Uh, although you may not need to sign up for the Remind now, it might be beneficial for next year. Uh, so if you haven't done that, just do so right now. And Instagram, of course, everything else is on there. All right. Time to end off with a bang. We're going to learn about cash flow. So cash is important. Cash is king. Cash really is everything. Notice the rhyme scheme there. Uh, so. Cash flow is of utmost importance when looking at an LBO as it's the flow of cash that pays down principal payments and interest on the debt that's owed. Remember, leverage buyouts, right? Someone explain to me what a leverage buyout is really quick. What's up? With a lot of debt, with a lot of leverage. So that's the key thing, but yeah, very good. So that's, that's what we're referring to when we talk about those interest and principal payments. Right? So investment bankers usually calculate the value of a firm as the present value of all future cash flows, all free cash flows to the firm. So present value simply means looking at the amount of money it's going to make in the future and discounting it and kind of equating it to the amount that it would be worth right now. Because money right now, $100 right now, is going to be worth something else in the future. It might be $100 right now, but if you actually adjust it with inflation and things of that nature, it might actually be worth $105 in the future. So when you're doing something with present value, you're usually accounting for that disparity. Although this is not an accounting class, and usually we never get this technical, so I'm not requiring you by any means to understand that completely. Key picture here is that cash flow is important. It's another one of those things that you want to consider when looking at the value of a company holistically. So free cash flow is 
different from general cash flow in that you're uh, adding back non-cash expenses, yada, 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 that's, that's regular cash flow, but you're subtracting capital expenditures from regular cash flow. So capital expenditures are essentially the expenses that come with investing in capital goods or, or certain things like machinery, uh, new technologies, etc. So lending for an LBO. A lot of you guys probably had the question, well, okay, you get a lot of debt, right? You incur a lot of debt whenever you proceed with an LBO. Where are you getting this money from? Or at least, how are you identifying the amount of money you need for an LBO? And uh, the key picture here from the lender's perspective is EBITDA. It's one of the most used acronyms you're ever going to hear in the world of investment banking. Reed's already smiling because he's probably seen 30 Reddit memes on EBITDA, right? It's it's the most popular amalgamated letters in the world. So it stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And uh, lenders identify the amount they're willing to lend for an LBO using multiples of this cash flow measure. So they'll multiply it by five, multiply it by six, etc. The amount that they multiply it by will depend upon how LBO markets are currently performing. So they lend by some multiple of EBITDA, like I just said, and the exact multiple can vary. Is there anything else I want to cover? Do you guys remember 1.3, how we talked about financial reports and financial statements? Can anyone tell me the difference between the two? This is a tough question because it's pretty technical. And again, I never really require you guys to do any accounting stuff. The Jason, you statement is made by the company. Kind of, yeah. And statements are usually found within those financial reports. Uh, I'm not sure if that's right. I, I've never looked into that personally. Uh, you're probably right, though. Uh, but the key thing that I wanted to cover right here is that there are financial statements that are located within financial reports. The three financial reports we talk about are the 10K, 10Q, and the prospectus. Remember, 10K is your annual report, 10Q, quarterly, and then your prospectus is that report that you put out to the world whenever you allow the world to buy some securities, allow the general public to buy some investment that you are now holding. Uh, and it, details the risks and opportunities of the company that's listing that investment for everyone to buy. Financial statements, on the other hand, are, are the big trifecta of the statement of cash flows, the income statement, and the balance sheet. And usually you're going to find your accounting profit on the income statement, and we're going to get to that in a second, and your cash flow on the statement of cash flows. And in a second, I'm going to delineate the difference between the two, because there is a big difference. So this is a graphic that Aaron made. Unfortunately, Aaron could not be here today because there's a familial birthday party she has to attend. But it's still a really, it's still a really beautiful graphic, right? So accounting profit are the total earnings calculated using accounting rules. Uh, accounts for all expenses incurred by the firm, uh, yada, yada, yada. But the big thing is that it's not used for paying suppliers, employees, or providing dividends by any means. Uh, cash flow is a bit more crucial. Uh, it represents the actual cash available for payments, and it recognizes non-cash things like depreciation and amortization. So when something within your company depreciates, let's say that uh, hmm, we're in Breaking Bad, and you, ha you know those big washing machines they used in Breaking Bad? Let's say that you're using those washing machines for your business, and eventually that washing machine that you bought for 10 k is now worth 4 k because of depreciation. Well, you're not going to write a check like you would for an expense. Right? Uh, it, it's just that some asset you've purchased has gone down in value. You're not writing a check to anyone for that, to pay for that expense. So, but, so while that may not be uh, considered inside of your regular income statement or accounting profit, it's something that you consider in your cash flow. Does anyone know what amortization is? So it, it's expensing non-tangible assets. Uh, so things like intellectual property uh, or software. And, and that's why EBITDA is such an important measure because it takes into account both depreciation and amortization and it's really showing you underlying facets of companies that may not be covered by accounting profit and things of that nature. And when you're looking at a startup or really techie companies that are now becoming really popular, right? Like software companies, OpenAI for example. Does OpenAI have a lot of physical assets? Maybe they have some server rooms. But the money, the big money in OpenAI is located with the software and the intellectual property that's around it. So that's why you need to consider things like amortization. Uh, and, and then for really high, real asset heavy firms, you start considering things like depreciation. But that's why EBITDA is such a coveted measurement tool, right? 
Uh, both concepts are involved in measuring the financial performance of a company, of course, and both are essential for understanding a company's financial health. Uh, and then just a quick example of how you may look at cash flow, right? So let's say I run some kind of consulting game, right? And I charge a guy 15K for my services. So inside of my profitable, inside of my income statement, I'm going to say, hey, I charged this guy 15K. I'm going to credit that to myself. Uh, and, you know, of course, he's debited. But in a cash flow statement, until I receive that 15K in my pocket, I have no money. In fact, I, I, might, be net, I might be net negative. So cash flow statements take into account the actual money you have on hand, the actual money that you use to pay expenses, pay your workers, pay dividends, things like that. Accounting profitability will take into account uh, you know, various things that you don't necessarily have on hand now, but will have on hand in the future. And that's where credits and debits come into play, things like that. So basically cash flow statements solos. What's up? Basically solos. Solos? I guess so. I don't really know what that means. That's probably like the... New skibbity riz terminology. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not like on Instagram reels like that. Right? I'd say like, I think I'm like the closest to Turkish Pondel Dingle. Oh, yeah, here you go. Loki, I'm going to need you to elaborate on this. So, IRR, I'm not going to lie, this is so complicated. I was reading the Investopedia. <laughs> if you look at the equation, it's so confusing. I don't even know what it means. I'm sure I can explain more. But the main point of IRR is two things. First is what it is. So the definition is that the interest rate that equates the present value of all cash flows to zero. Um, Ion can definitely elaborate on that more. But the second thing that you should know is that a higher IRR is better. So when you're looking for investment opportunities, you always want an investment opportunity that gives you a higher IRR. And Ion will <laughs> elaborate more on what that equation means. Sure. David covered the key components, and not even I understand this equation in its totality because, look, we teach introductory things here. We don't teach the actual technical details that go into everything. The key picture is that when you go into technicals and start learning how to do a discounted cash flow analysis, you realize things like, oh, I'm using a discounted cash flow analysis whenever I calculate the present value of future cash flows, of future free cash flows in a leveraged buyout. There you go. You just tied an introductory concept to something that someone could randomly learn, some random equation someone or some random financial model people can learn on Excel. You want to have that backing knowledge. But let's break down some of the variables in here, although we're never going to get back to this again. Right? CF, initial cash flow, that's denoted by the naught. Right? If you ever take a math class at school or a chemistry class or a physics class, you're going to see naught. Naught always means initial. It's that little zero that's in the subscript. Then you have your CF1, CF2, etc. cetera. Uh, those numbers are your periods. N is equal to your period. Uh, and that number is also what's being used to, well, square, cube, well, quadru, whatever, in the denominator. Although that's really boring, right? Key thing here is we're solving for that IRR. And IRR just gives you the rate of return on an investment. You want a higher RRR. I, oh, my God. You want a higher IRR, right? That's always better for, that's always better for you and your security. All right, so private equity returns, or the returns that you make on an investment. Um, returns in private equity markets are more or, or more valuable than returns on public equity markets. But as we've learned in IBC, a lot of times, whenever you make more, often there's associated risk. Here, it's in the form of deals being highly leveraged and investments being less liquid than public equities. And um, another thing to know is, Private, private equity returns positively correlate with current market conditions. So if the market is doing well, um, or most asset classes like stocks or real estate are doing well, private equity, private equity returns will likely also do well. Right. And the key thing to note there is that there's a direct relationship, right? There's a positive correlation between the two. And uh, does anyone know the difference between private and public equity? Okay. Well, it's kind of simple, right? But private equity is usually referring to private companies and equity securities regarding those. Can anyone name me an equity security? Remember, equity means ownership. Stocks. Remember, 1.1. We talked about the three different types of securities that we would vaguely mention. Equity, debt, and hybrid. When we talk about equity securities, we're referring to stocks. When we talk about debt securities, we're referring to IOUs and bonds. When we talk about hybrid securities, we're talking about 
uh, credit default swaps. We're talking about preferred shares. We're talking about convertible bonds. Uh, I'm not sure if convertible bonds is one of those. But there are a lot of various hybrid securities, although we never really touch on those. But remember, equity means ownership. So private equity is private ownership. Private companies that are giving you private stock, essentially. Public equity, public companies that you can find on the New York Stock Exchange that you can buy the stock of. So big difference between the two. And right here we're talking about how in private equity markets, uh, risk is high, but that also usually means that returns are a bit high. So as Ion and Shannon just explained, when you have an investment, obviously you want profit. So as Shannon explained, for a lot of these private equity firms, they're trying to gain profit. However, a concept you should understand is you don't gain profits until you sell or you don't lose until you sell. So even if you have this crazy investment that gives you 100 extra turns, it's not profitable until you sell it. Therefore, we have to talk about exiting. Exiting is where you sell something. So if you have an investment, it's extremely profitable. You increase it, then you have to sell that company. Because most private equity limited partnerships are structured to last 10 years or less, a lot of these sponsor firms have a short time table. So basically, the way that a lot of these deals are structured are very short term. It's not decades on decades, but rather a couple years. So oftentimes, they would sell relatively quickly, which brings us to co the controversy. So continuing, continuing on what David said, there's a controversy about private equity exiting regarding that many private equity firms quickly flip their target company cosmetically or just at a face value to quickly make profit. And uh, people claim that by doing this, they're not actually making meaningful ta changes and just want to make some quick money. But this is not true. I mean, in reality, private equity LBO sponsors add value in various ways. For example, management expertise, as we learned in last chapter, uh, re-engineering, and make, making meaningful changes. And all of these take a long time, hence why it says three to eight years. Um, and that's why this controversy is not true. Thank you. You guys remember what private equity firms did, right? How they connected with LBOs? Can anyone tell me about that? Yeah, so they're a sponsor firm. So remember, when we're doing a leverage buyout, we have the general partner and we have the limited partner. Now, we're assuming the general partner to be a private equity firm in this case. And when private equity firms are general partners, what they're doing with the leverage buyout is buying the company with a lot of debt. And then over the course of, let's say, 10 years or three to eight years, they're going to try and sell that company for a profit. It's like car flipping or house flipping, but obviously on crack because these are multi-billion dollar um, transactions. And then they're going to have limited partners that fund them with the debt that they need. So remember, private equity firms are the general sponsor within a leverage buyout then they're going to have various limited partners that funnel them with money. And limited partnerships are also pretty short. That's why you only have three to eight years or ten years. Plus, you wouldn't want too long of a time, right? You, you want to make your money at some point. So running that company for 50 years, uh, I, I don't know who else would invest in that besides someone with like a really, not even in a retirement plan. Like I, I have no idea where you find some kind of 50-year investment. Not even bonds can be held for that. All right. So, awesome, awesome since the purpose yeah. of an LBO is, of course, for the sponsor firm to make money, like everything else in investment banking, of course, they're going to have to eventually get out of it to make the money. So, there's three ways that a sponsor firm may do this. The first one is a valuation. This is through an IPO. So, they're going to be putting their company back to the, back on the public market. The second way is a strategic buyer or also an M&A. So they might sell their company to someone and take that as profit. And the last way is a secondary leverage buyout, which is recapitalization. This may be restructuring the company, restructuring your debts and whatever you need to do to, of course, turn a profit. Perfect. Thank you so much, Reed. So remember, we learned about this uh, in 5.1. It was a surmised version of it. Now we're going to dive deeper into it. But the key thing we're trying to take away here is what the hell are investment banks doing with all of this? Because this is an investment banking club, right? So why are we talking so much about leveraged buyouts and private equity? Well, it's because investment bankers can make a lot of money off of it via these three ways. Last way, not exactly, not entirely. First two ways, yes, 100%. So the first is an IPO. 
Um, yeah, so IPOs are the idealist of idealist methods of exit with a leverage buyout. Because you can make a lot of money and you're replacing a lot of the debt that you bought that leverage buyout with, with equity, which is nice. You don't always want debt. However, debt can be nice because remember we talked about the tax benefits last time, uh, etc. So, uh, but a, a few things, right? Future prospects of a company exiting an LBO are bright. Equity infusion is wanted, like I just mentioned. Public equity markets are bullish. What's the difference between a bull and a bear market? Can anyone like do the oh, motions? Oh, yeah, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. There we go. Yeah, and uh, investors see the company as desirable. So how does it work? A lead investment bank is tasked with, well, looking into the IPO, valuing that company, and also putting a price on the IPO shares. And we've talked about this extensively in 2.2. So for the most part, this should just be reviewed, right? But it's of vital importance that the share price doesn't break. Does anyone remember what the breakage of a share price entails? How exactly that works? If you don't make money, or if it goes below what you really want. Exactly. So does anyone remember what the word underwriting means? What does it mean to underwrite? Taking a financial risk for a profit. For a fee. For a fee. No, 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 you're close. You're close. No, no. But yeah, basically. So we need to look back at how an IPO works. So let's say a company. Let's say that uh, one of you guys starts a company. Caleb starts a company, right? It's an ice cream company, and he wants to take this company public. He wants to sell his ice cream shares to the world. He's going to first go to an investment bank. And the investment bank is going to say, hey, this is a pretty great idea. I'm going to make X, Y, Z. Yeah, we watched that video on that. We're going to make X, Y, Z amount of shares. I'm going to buy it from you, and then I'm going to sell it on the primary market. The money made from that is called the underwriting spread. So, uh, and that's where the financial risk for a fee comes in, because the investment banks don't know if they're going to be able to sell all of those shares they buy on the primary market. So they're going to charge a very large fee for it. And uh, then, after they're sold on the primary market, investment bankers kind of back off, right? But that's where they set. When they sell to the primary market, that's where they set the IPO price. And that's where this becomes important. A breakage of the IPO price would occur when the value, when the price at which you set, it, when you sold on the primary market, either goes way too high or way too low. And you can kind of see that with LinkedIn. In May of 2011, LinkedIn had an IPO price, remember, being sold on the primary market, of around $43, something along those lines. And then, uh, when it was being traded on the secondary market, it almost doubled, or in fact, it more than doubled, to around $95. So, uh, obviously, the investment bank was devastated, right? Institutional investors that sold after the primary market, right, that sold on the secondary market, were really happy. Uh, but the investors, like, the initial investors were not happy, right? The company that sold its shares to the institution, that sold its shares to the investment bank were, were really devastated because they definitely sold it for way less than that so the investment banker could make a profit uh, selling on the primary market. So remember, it's kind of hard for me to talk about all of it and you guys remember all of it. So just go back to 2.2 if you guys need a reference to how underwriting works. But yeah, that's how a breakage works. You don't want those shares in the secondary market to trade too high or too low too much above or too much below that price that you set for the share in the primary market. So, uh, and the lead investment bank will also form an underwriting syndicate. So two things, right? They're gonna help value that company, they're gonna help, they're gonna help set that IPO share price, and then they're gonna form an underwriting syndicate. Uh, does anyone know what an underwriting syndicate is already? Or have an idea? If you know what the word syndicate means, then you might be able to guess. It's like a company that underwrites. People, yeah, that's that's kind of the th that's kind of the key thing here because a syndicate emphasizes plural. Uh, what you're doing with an underwriting syndicate is you're taking multiple investment banks and you're doing that IPO. You're selling uh, those shares instead of it just being one investment bank. So this makes the sale of shares easier and it mitigates risk by spreading it amongst many institutions. Uh, the disadvantages of an IPO in general is that they involve really high transaction costs. Why? Because underwriting is taking a financial risk for a fee. And if you're already making an underwriting syndicate, that means that there are a lot of fees to be paid, right? And an IPO can fail due to volatile market conditions. What if a financial crash happens in the midst of a bull market? What if every single stock was a bubble? Then you're kind of screwed, right? Because you're going to sell not at the premium you want in, a bare, in bare conditions, and you don't really want that. So this is what an investment banking syndicate looks like, and Reed is going to walk us through it. Oh. 
Okay, so this is basically exactly what I just explained. So the issue incorporation will sell uh, its stocks to an, to the original investment banker, right? Guys, pay attention to the syndicate. This is important. And the original investment banker will call on the underwriting syndicate and syndicate. Whatever. And then, uh, you ever played Assassin's Creed Syndicate? You don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. Uh, they'll call on other investment bankers to come help them. For one, this will mitigate risk, and it'll and it'll also make it easier to determine the correct price that the IPO should be. So once they decide that, then they'll sell it. Then they'll all sell it. They'll all come together to help find people to sell uh, the stock to. Exactly. Thank you, Reed. And usually, a lot of IPOs are done with multiple investment banks. That's important to note. It's not just one investment bank that does it for the most part. So you're going to see a lot of underwriting syndicates, actually. It's not just an LBO exit, but regular IPOs as well. So this is one of the most ideal scenarios, because there are the least amount of players involved in the game, meaning you know, uh, less things to coordinate, etc. So it's the most common and most preferred because of its speed and simplicity. Uh, the strategic buyer will purchase the target firm because it sees synergy. Do you guys remember what a strategic buyer is? What does M&A stand for? Perfect. Mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. So if you want to acquire a firm, you want to acquire a target company, and acquire usually implies that you're a big firm and you want to buy a smaller firm as opposed to a merger. Merger is usually a combination of two similar size firms. So a strategic buyer is an acquirer. They're a big firm that wants to buy a smaller firm. And that's what's happening right now. That big firm is going to buy that firm that has been LBO'd, that the private equity firm or the LBO sponsor is trying to exit from. And uh, obviously a strategic buyer is going to do this. We covered this in chapter four. Uh, due to synergy. Does anyone remember what the word synergy means? If you play Marvel Contest of Champions, you're probably going to know. Yes. Yeah, well, what both of you said. Remember, key thing for a synergy, one plus one is equal to three. Even Faraz Rana recited this. Remember, he's the private equity and M&A lawyer we talked with for chapter four. But all it conveys is that the individual values of a firm are nothing compared to the combined value of the firm. Because one plus one is not equal to three. One plus one individually are one and one. And usually they equal two. But synergy is implying that them both creates exponential rewards, right? So they'll therefore pay a premium for the firm, the strategic buyer. And this, is, and this as a whole is ideal because, like I did mention, there are less individuals involved in the transaction. Whereas in an IPO, you're going to have that initial firm that's issuing shares. <laughs> alongside the LBO sponsor that's you know overseeing all of it with your investment bank then the various institutional investors in the primary market and then the secondary market investors like the general public the millions of people that want to invest in shares as opposed to an investment bank an LBO firm with its LBO sponsor and a strategic buyer so many less factors so many less variables to consider right uh, and we kind of talked about that right over here lastly a secondary leverage buyout. So we have our primary s leverage buyout. Uh, now we have a secondary leverage buyout, and this is usually just to kind of prolong the game because one and two didn't work. Your IPO or your or your M and purchase via strategic buyer did not work. And uh, like Reed did mention, <laughs> secondary leverage buyouts go hand in hand with recapitalizations. And like he mentioned, recapitalizations are just a restructuring of the equity and debt of some kind of company. So this is the last option, and it's the least likely. But let's say you have bear markets, and let's say you don't have a strategic buyer. This might be what you have to go with, because limited partnerships are limited, right? They only last three to eight years, and the 10 years is like the max holding period of a PE firm. And usually, on average, they'll hold for three to eight years, because those limited partnerships run out. So they have to sell the company they LBO to another private equity, another PE firm. And again, this generally occurs due to that deal, that limited partnership coming to an end and capital being returned to the limited partners. So the disadvantage is that both ends of the transaction have really sophisticated people working in it. So they know, or at least that secondary, that second private equity firm knows that this first private equity firm is losing money or its partnership is coming to an end. So they can push things to the brink and they can really drive a hard bargain for the purchase of this LBO company. Meaning that your initial private equity company is not looking to make as much money. And if you ever look at Apollo, 
I'll tell you guys that. I'll tell you guys about that in a second. Reed, you might have already seen something about it. But if you look at Apollo, they're like one of the most scumbag private equity firms within the industry. And they're like, they do like really terrible things. And this is one of the things that they'll usually do. So private... My bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Just one more thing. One more thing about Apollo, though. Uh, so they recently had uncovered one of their investments. They invested $20 billion into life insurance investments, right? You, you know what that means? They were betting on the age at which people would die. And they'd make money if they were right, if they bet on the right age. Pretty crazy how people make money nowadays, right? But I guess money is money. All right. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, did, did I hit that senior age retirement parlay or whatever? Senior age death parlay. But these are the credits. Uh, guys, again, thank you so much for the wonderful year we've had. 20 plus meetings. We're the best club at NHS. Objectively. All right. That's